Hi, Captain Dave Hanson with another phenomenal show for you today. We got a really special guest. I know we're going late today. We normally got this show going at noon, but today we were out fishing. And I know a lot of you saw the picture of the big whopper fish we caught today. We caught a nice big giant Dorado today while we were out fishing. I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. I know we're going late, but we're doing the best we can. And we got a super special guest, and we're going to talk a little bit about El Nino. We're going to talk about some surf fishing. We're going to talk about everything that you can imagine fishing. We're going to answer your questions, but you're going to need to send in your questions to my phone at 949-374-0786. And remember, today is... Uh, Wednesday, it's kind of free flow Wednesday. We got the Pacific Sport Fishing Emblem, Pacific Sport Fishing Alliance Emblem up. We'll show you their QR code. I know you guys are all watching all those videos I'm posting about fishing in Mag Bay, fishing in Lopez Mateos the last week I was up there. Well, you can do all that with Pacific Sport Fishing Alliance, plus Kelly Girl and I are going up to Alaska in September to fish with uh, Larry and and everybody at Pacific Sport Fishing Alliance. So you don't want to miss that trip. I think there's a couple of uh, a couple of um, openings for that. The uh, second trip, I know the first trip is booked solid. I think the second trip has a couple of openings. But uh, we'll throw that up on the screen in a little bit. We got all kinds of stuff to talk about. But I got my good friend Bill Varney, who gang. I know I have a lot of great guests come on the show all the time. I'm just, I'm not going to try to build Bill's ego up. It'll never be as big as mine, but Bill, I'm going to bring you in in just a second. As I look through everything on YouTube and Facebook, as far as guests go, you are so many views ahead of everybody else. It's not even fair. I don't know what it is about you and your your velvety voice, but people love to listen to you on the show, man. Everybody loves to listen to Bill. So without any further ado, let's bring Bill in. Buddy, welcome to the show. Oh my God, would you please stop? Like, is this some kind of bromance that's going on? <laughs> it is, it is, it is. Unbelievable. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, it's great to be here. And, and man, there's so many like exciting things to talk about. Absolutely. And we're going to talk about them. I mean, look at what's going on in Southern California right now. El, El Nino, Stormwatch, yep. 2023. They're getting a little bit of rain. They're, everyone's all excited about that. Hoop netting is going to be phenomenal for the rest of the week with all this rain coming down into the harbor. But let's talk about what do you think is going to happen with this rain? What do you think is going to go on with this El Nino? You think we're having a real El Nino this year? We're, we're having, we're going to probably end up having one of not the strongest El Nino we've ever had, but probably per, per the, the meteorologist, one of, one of the stronger ones we've had, you know, all the way since like 1984. And it really seems to be building up that way. You know, as a lot of folks know that I spend time in, in California and I spend time in Colorado and I'm out here for Christmas in Colorado. And what we're seeing now out here is we have seen about an average amount of snow that we would have, which is which is common with El, in El Nino, but a much warmer winter. And and every time we have seen this pattern, California has had warmer water, a, a lot a, a lot of uh, precipitation, and and really quite a winter, and then good fishing afterwards. So I'd be really surprised if that's not what we saw see in the upcoming year. Yeah, I don't know if you saw, I had Chris Dunn on the show a couple months ago and, and you know, he's the weather, San Diego weatherman. He's also all over the place and he's a pilot. And he was saying the same thing you're saying. It looks like it's going to be one of those real big ones that we have probably like 83 or the nine. what was that, 91, right. 92, we had a pretty decent one. Yep. One thing I didn't understand though, what he was talking about was the water temperature that isn't really the big thing. It's the amount of moisture in the air. It's like, yes. like every time I have you on the show, I learned so much more about what's going on in the ocean. I always thought El Nino meant warm water, but Chris was telling me it has to do with the moisture in the air and the amount of rain we're going to get. 
So it looks like yep. that's probably what's going to happen here because they're already seeing measurable about the rain right now going falling down in LA. Exactly, you're exactly right. It has much more to do with the the amount of water in the atmosphere than it certainly does with the the warmth of the ocean. The ocean warms up, and then that affects the storm pattern. And and so, in a traditional year, you know, we're going to see storms form in the Aleutian Islands, right on the edge of the the. the edge of Russia there and then swoop down along the coast and they'll be much colder and because they're colder they don't have as much moisture to them so they may drop you know a considerable amount of snow in the Sierras but as far as the rest of the coast all the way down to San Diego and and Baja they don't really drop a tremendous amount of moisture when we have these storms um, that are caused by El Nino although many of them begin to form up in the Aleutian Islands, rather than sliding down the Washington, Oregon, California coast, they actually go straight down out of the Pacific toward Hawaii and then come straight in from Hawaii into, and that's why like here in Colorado, for example, even though we, the precipitation is happening on the West coast, what will happen instead of those storms coming across, you know, from like the, would be the northwestern corner of the state and down across the state they come in directly from the west so all of the mountain the rocky mountains where you have like aspen and everything that's in the west of the rocky mountains it those mountains stop that those clouds and that orographic lift comes off of the desert that warm air lifts under the cold air and you have this tremendous amount of snow and rain we get in Colorado, but primarily in the western part of the state. When, when you look at the center part of the state, which is like where you've got uh, Keystone and Breckenridge and Arapahoe Basin and all of that before you go over the mountains to Denver, that doesn't get as much precipitation because it's getting wrung out in the western mountains. So that's what we're going to see. It looks like we're going to see that again this year. And, and that means anywhere between the coast and Utah is just going to get hammered. Wow. Now, since we're talking, we got you on here. And there, I don't know anybody in my uh, sphere of influence that knows more about surf fishing in California than you. So does this mean good for surf fishing or does this mean it's going to be gnarly with all the runoff and all the shifting sands and everything what do you think this is going to do for you for your thing for your game yeah, plan that, that's a really good question you know it, it will probably um belabor the the winter surf fishing so for, for example in years where we have drought you know quote unquote drought years um and we have all these a, a number of santa annas in a row where you go into the beach in January and February and it's, you know, 75 degrees or so and, and, and just beautifully sunny and the wind is really calm. In years like that, we have really extended surf fishing sessions where we're in particular yellowfin croaker and spotfin croaker, some really big ones up to 10 pounds are just going wild in the middle of the winter. When we have these El Nino years, you have so much uh, turbidity in the water, so much water turning over, the rain, the, the, all the gunk that gets in the ocean, all the stuff that washes down from Northern California, that surf fishing really slows down a lot. And then what happens is that ends in the spring. And because the water is warm, the sand crabs come up and they start losing their shells about a month early, you normally see it around the beginning of April instead of the beginning of May. And you have normally a very good surf fishing summer, in particular for Corbina. What your fear always is with when the water warms is that the sand crabs will move north. There'll be many less crabs you'd find in San Diego and Orange County than in a regular year. And it slows down the fishing in the year after the El Nino occurs. Okay. Do you know what's going on right now in San Clemente? Have you paid attention to what they're doing? They're rebuilding the beaches there right now? Yes. Do yes. You see that? Mm -hmm. I, I know about that. Um, well, first of all, when they had the last big El Nino and it washed away, that um, I don't remember the street that the parking lot is on, but it, it had a um, little child's park in it and, and bathrooms and a, a city parking lot. Well, the surf got so big, it washed it away. Well, it wasn't like the city could be just like, okay, we'll send the bulldozers down, right? We'll just like put the soil back in, put the rocks back into place. People will park their life will go on. They had to go to the Coastal Commission 
<laughs> to get permission, which I thought was the funniest thing, you know, because they had already given them permission to build it in the first place and the ocean washed it away. And all of a sudden they got to go back to the permitting process. So this dredging and this work down there, this has been in the planning stages. Are you ready for this? For eight years. It took no. them eight years to do that. So people, and we talked about this on the show a little bit before, and, and people often ask me this. We see that dredging going on down there. The water is all bubbly and, and turbid, and you know it's a mess down there. So instead of fishing there, we go down the beach 300 yards, and we fish down there. And, and we go down there, we don't get any bites. Well, it's because when they dredge, they suck all the sand off the bottom of it's either out in the ocean and they're dredging toward the beach to make the beach larger, or it's in an estuary or a bay like uh, Bolsa Chica or the Newport Harbor, or um, recently it was Huntington Harbor when they were redoing the configuration. And when those pipes, so those pipes are like 18 inch uh, plastic pipes, uh, ABS, okay. when that sucks that mud out of the bottom and, and sand, it's pulling up crabs, worms, clams, and that's all getting flushed out right in that inner tidal area and fishing within the first week or so of that pipe being put in place right around the end of that pipe is phenomenal. Sometimes you'll see two, 300 birds right around the end of that pipe. And they're not there just having a convention, you know, they're there to feed. <laughs> because the food's getting pushed on there. But the thing I thought was kind of eight years. Can you, it took eight years to do that project at Hole in the Fence Beach. And who knows how long this one at San Clemente is the same thing, eight years for them to start doing right. the San Clemente one. Exactly, because it's got to go through the process. They started yesterday. Can you believe that? They started yesterday. Today they're getting blown out. Giant Southeast, just gnarly. They could have done this last year. They could have done it so many different ways. They pick the biggest El Nino we've seen in 20 years or 30 years or 40 years. Oh, my gosh. And I don't – maybe you can un help me understand this. And I know there's a lot of people that are watching. Do you think – that when they built Dana Point Harbor, that had an effect. And I know nothing happens. I mean, we're in a microwave culture where if it doesn't happen exactly the same thing as it did yesterday, then that's the end of the world. I know that. I see it every day. But when they built Dana Point Harbor, that stopped the flow of sand going down because it's a giant yep. bay. If you look at a topographical map from Dana Point down to La Jolla, is a gigantic bay. It's a humongous bay. It's called Capistrano Bay. When they built the harbor, all of a sudden that stopped the flow of the sand going down the coast. I think, maybe I'm wrong, but if you look at Dana Point Harbor, in the very back of Dana Point Harbor, back by the Marine Institute, they have this giant sandbar, humongous sandbar, and they dredge it every few years, and they blow all that sand down to Salt Creek, or down to a Hole in the Fence Beach, and then another year later, all that sand is back in there. Don't, maybe I'm wrong. I'm just throwing stuff out there. Don't you think this is kind of silly to take millions and millions and millions of taxpayers' dollars and blow sand onto a beach? When, when it just gets washed away again? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'm not, maybe I'm not seeing the whole thing, yeah. but the amount of money they spent rebuilding um, Hole in the Fence Beach the next big El Nino, which is just happens to be now, they just got done with that project three or four months ago, and now here comes this big El Nino. All those giant waves are going to go in there and take all that sand and make it go away, and they're doing the same thing at San Clemente. I don't know. Maybe you can explain it to me so I can understand it. Well, you know, the, the original purpose, which was in the early 60s when they began all this dredging that started up in the South Bay, Hermosa, Manhattan, Redondo, then moved its way down to um, uh, uh, 
Orange County and then into, into San Diego was to extend the width of the beaches so the homes along the beaches would not be impacted by the surf. If you went back to Hermosa Beach where the Strand is there now and you went back there to the 1920s and 30s, the water came all the way up to where the Strand was and, and there, were, there were pebbles there and then at low tide there was sand below the pebbles and that's where the water naturally came to. So they built up near the way and, and when they originally built in places like Newport Beach, Hermosa Beach, those homes were second homes for people who lived in Pasadena and they would ride their horse down there. They would take their horse and buggies down to the beach there and they would stay there for a few days. Many of those homes, whether it was on um, on uh, the sand spit, which is where the wedge is now or up in Hermosa Beach, those homes were wood homes that were actually built on basically four flat rocks. They knew the water was going to come up and down. And of course, in 1920, you know, it didn't cost a million and a half dollars for a piece of property or to build a house. So they'd build these summer homes. And so as the years went on in, in the South Bay and down in Newport Beach and so forth, that real estate, not the homes particularly, but the real estate became so valuable that in the 1960s, they decided to widen all of these beaches to keep the surf and the water away. Um, now, part of their problem is they're worrying about, you know, the rise of the water levels uh, in addition to the erosion that's caused naturally by things like El Nino. So they've it, it's completely ignited their whole position on why they need this sand there is because, you know, not only does it just naturally go away, but now as the ocean rises, it's going to wash away those $15 million homes. And those people who live in a house that's worth $15 million give a lot more money to their political friends than those of us who rent. And that's why they get a big beach. Okay, so you're telling me that all those beaches, Manhattan Beach, Hermosa Beach, down the down that strand all the way to Redondo, how thick and wide those beaches are, that's not normal. They've made those, is what you're saying. Exactly, exactly. Prior to the dredging, so let's say 19, well, beginning of time till 1950 roughly, if you stood in Palos Verdes at Malaga Cove on a clear day back then, and let's say 1935, you're down there, and you stood at PV and you looked towards Santa Monica, you would have seen cliffs that went all the way down to Redondo Beach. And at the base of those cliffs, as far as you could see, was river rock that looked ex very similar to the rock you see at San Onofre. And that went all the way to Santa Monica. And sometimes sand in the summer would be deposited over those rocks and it would be more of a sandy beach. And in the winter, all of that sand would basically be washed away by the, the northern currents, the currents coming from, you know, Alaska down toward the south would wash that sand away and it would all be rocky again. So all of that's been filled in. All of that area from Palos Verdes all the way to, all, not to Malibu, but to about Topanga Canyon has all been dredged and filled in over the decades so that they can improve the width of the beach so more people can enjoy the beach, and but in particular to protect the real estate of the people who lived along there. Okay, that's interesting to me because I didn't know that. I was looking at some old pictures that Steve Carson was posting the other day. And I love Steve, and he's been on the show before. And it, and I remember, mm -hmm. and I ran the tour boat in Long Beach for years, and we talked about how from Long Beach all the way up to uh, Redondo, or all the way up to Palos Verdes, all that was oil wells all over the sand. Mm -hmm. All there was mm -hmm. was those those little horses pumping oil, and there were yep. derricks all over on the cliffs. And all that, and then all of a sudden, I think it was in the 50s when they started to understand that. And it's not that way today. Don't get me wrong. I know that. But in the 50s, I think, is when they decided that oil was worth less than real estate. And that's <laughs> when they started developing these oil wells, right? That's exactly right. That's exactly <laughs> right. If people look at old pictures, you wouldn't even believe it, gang, where these multi-million dollar homes are setting now. Those were all oil wells. California, 
This is going to blow everyone's mind. Set dead center on the largest oil deposit in the world, the Wilmington oil deposit. It's bigger than anything in Saudi Arabia or anywhere mm -hmm. in the Middle East. We set on the largest oil deposit in the world. I know we're not allowed to touch it, and that's a whole different show and that forever. I know we're not going to touch that because we don't want to lose half our audience. But there was a time where everywhere up and down the coast was pumping oil. I mean, when I was a kid still, and I'm not that old, I'm only 62, but Huntington Beach, all of Huntington Beach was oil wells when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. I remember with my dad driving up and down the coast highway and you'd get above that Carl or that uh, Huntington Beach power plant where the pier is and all that, that, and all those cliffs, that was all oil fields. That was all oil pumps. Pretty crazy yeah. where we, we're at today compared to then and now. Whew. If you could touch that oil, boy, we solve a lot of the world's problems right now. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that, I don't think that oil is very far away either. It's easy to get to. There's a lot of it out there. You don't have to drill down very far. But yeah. But now, gang, if you want to talk to me or Bill, something's wrong with my uh, chat button. I keep pushing it. It does nothing comes up. So look at if you want to talk to me, either Bill or I. Send your text message to 949-374-0786. We will do our very best between the two of us to try to answer your questions. And this is the best time to ask questions because you all listen to me every day and you know how uneducated I am. Bill's very educated and he's very eloquent on the way he speaks. So you might get some of those questions you're always wondering about. But here's a good question that I got from a good friend of mine, Tim Ogilvy. Now that the Encinitas power plant is gone and there's no more warm water being pumped into the ocean, what is the effect it has on surf fishing? That, that's a good question. You know, of course, we saw the exact same thing happen with the AES plant in Redondo Beach. When they closed that down, the bubble hole inside of King Harbor there um, was over and the literally the fishing was over. Um, you know, that warm water... Um, you know, I'm not a, I, I've got to say that I'm not a scientist, so I can't say that this is better than that or whatever, but I can tell you just from observation of 60, you know, I'm 65, so probably been remembering surf fishing for about 64, you know, 61 years, maybe long time. Um, whenever we had that warm water situation, whether it was down there or up here or down in Carlsbad, that always attracted all of the different levels. It, it had the, um, marine algae which is the building block of of all the food system in the ocean then it had the plankton and then above that it had the small bait fish and then what was attracted from the bait fish of course was yellowtail and pelagic fish like bonita and so on and so forth now that that's gone what has happened is the fish that were in that area they didn't of course die off they just moved on to where they can find food again so that those hot water areas worked as an aggregating device in the ocean for fish. And we see aggregating devices, for example, around oil derricks, because oil derricks, of course, the growth on the derrick below the water attracts a small fish to eat the, the clams or the mussel or the algae on that, and that attracts larger fish. So I think that's, you know, we saw a slowdown in areas like that. And it does hurt surf fishing in that general area, but those fish have just moved on to where they can naturally find more food. They're generally looking for safety and food. And so probably any area around there where you've got estuaries coming into the ocean um, in, in within five miles in either direction, that's where they're going to probably congregate now. Okay. And then my other question, what about San Onofre when they shut down that plant that had that warm water pipe that was pumping out lots of stuff. But I think I heard you on a, maybe on Pete's show talking about the sand crabs at San Onofre probably 10 years ago or something and how that pipe that was pumping the warm water had a, a diverse effect of the sand crabs there at San Onofre. Now that their pipe yes. is not pumping anymore, are the sand crabs back down at San Onofre? Well, the funny thing is, is that the sand crabs are back down there, but the clams, particularly the um, pismo clams that were there, are much less now. 
because they act as filtration devices. And that was really how they were surviving is that warmer water was creating more of a plankton bloom for them. And so once that warm water became neutralized and the same temperature as all the water around it, a lot of that dissipated. And of course, the water was there, you know, the power plant there was an unusual situation because it created so much warm water, um, cool, cooling the inside of the plant, which was different than AES, for example, who was using it for cooling turbines versus the cooling that's used in nuclear uh, energy. So it was producing so much warm water in its in its in the area where that water was being dissipated into the ocean it really was hurting the environment there was no question about it on the other hand on the periphery of that area where that warmer water was mixing with the cooler water was a very productive area it's 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 glass half full situation was going on there so uh, yes it does make for better surf fishing there but as anybody knows who's fished there for years there has been phenomenal spot fin croaker fishing all the way from the surf spot um, to the very last parking spot there all along the coast there. It's been phenomenal spot fin croaker fishing for the last 40 years down there. Very, very good. That hasn't changed really at all. Oh, it didn't, it didn't get affected by them shutting off the power plant. No, but, but other fish like Corbina and stuff that you would rarely catch down there because of the, uh, the, the quantity of crabs that were up by trestles or by cottons in particular um, and the clams that were up there and that stuff, that was where a lot of those fish hung out. Now I'm sure they've spread out more there because there's more food. And here's something, I understand this, you understand this, people don't understand. So at San Onofre, above San, and when I say above, that means headed towards LA is where Bill's talking about, San Mateo Point, trestles, all that yeah. stuff. The prevailing currents in Southern California go from L.A. to San Diego. So, therefore, that water would push down the coast. And that's why above the power plant was where you would find more sand crabs and more corbina. And then below, because of that warm water moving down the coast, that would cause that. So, that's why when you're listening to Bill and I, I'm just trying to help you understand what, what's going on. We saw, and I don't know if this has anything to do with anything, but when that power plant was going there was so much kelp that kelp at san onofre there was kelp everywhere now there's no kelp at san onofre now it's very strange i don't understand it it goes against everything we've ever learned about kelp because kelp usually likes to grow in colder water now the water's colder at san onofre but the kelp's gone so nothing makes sense anymore you can just throw all the books away i think Nothing, nothing matters anymore. It's weird. What do you think that is caused by? Well, um, if, if I was to put my mask on and go down there, I, I would bet my bottom dollar that there's purple urchin down there. So when the water was warmer around that area, purple, well, ur urchin in general and also sea anemones, um, they grow rapidly in cold water, in cooler water. The cooler the water is, the faster that they grow and they multiply. So when that water was warmer, you know, unnaturally so warmer around that area, it wasn't too warm to kill the roots of the kelp, but it was warm enough to keep the, the purple urchins down to a minimum. And the problem with the purple urchin, is, and, and this has been known for decades, I mean, at least for brothers who started um, uh, Dive and Surf, which was the one who invented the wetsuit, um, that they would go out in their yacht with other divers and go down and crush the purple urchin off a of PV, off of Ballas Verdes, with hammers, because what they do is they creep along the bottom and they eat the roots. I mean, you could have a 60, 80, 100 foot um, giant kelp plant and this little tiny urchin, you know, this the size of the top of a coffee can chews away at the root and it dies and off it floats and it's gone. So I think that's probably what happened when the temperature, the water changed, it increased the number of, of both starfish and, and um, the purple urchin that eat the roots of that kelp. And that very well might have happened because the thing is, Dave, you go to a lot of other places, you know, the, the mouth of uh, San Diego Harbor, um, on and on, Palos Verdes, there's tons of kelp. 
So, so how is it one little, you know, one area specifically has very little or no kelp and then everything else, which is, you know, like the scientific equivalent is doing well. It's got to be something on the bottom. Yeah. Gang, this is something, it's really cool that Bill and I are talking about this. This is something on the inside of uh, CCA and all these closures and the MLPs and everything that happened which is very interesting. And Bill and I have had this conversation offline without you guys knowing, but there is something going on right now with this urgent thing where they've gone back and they said, and they asked Wayne Coda and they've, and Bill's been in the meetings where they go, Hey, I know the area is closed, but could you send the commercial urgent divers into this area to start to get the, because gang in Laguna, Laguna is getting devastated. It has these giant kelp forests that are no longer there because of the fact that when they closed these giant areas, there was no longer allowed to commercially dive to catch us our uni that we all so much love at the sushi bars and they love it all over the world. And these sea urchins come from Southern California. Now the commercial divers are no longer able to go in there. The urchin, like Bill was saying, eats the hold fast of the kelp. That's their food. That's their diet. That's what they eat. When you eat the roots of the plant, they break off and they float away. And then these urchins just multiply like you can't even comprehend. You guys don't understand. When you go, like Bill said, you go down to the bottom and look, San Onofre is probably covered with them. That's why there's no urchin or no uh, kelp mm -hmm. growing there. Same with Laguna. Same with a lot of places. And now they're waving the white flag going, whoa, we may have made a mistake here by not allowing you guys to fish in these areas. The commercial fishermen that fish for urchins, they help the environment out so much. Sea urchins basically useless in the, in the uh, ocean, right, Bill? Yeah, and I mean, they've got their place in the ocean. But here's the problem. is like, did you know that, you know, <laughs> People look at the urchin and they say like, well, why is it something we're worrying about? Because if we just let nature do its own thing, right, the urchin would have overexpanded and killed all the kelp anyway. But that's not the truth because there's animals that eat urchins. And so, the, and those are otters. So if you look historically at otters in California, forget Washington, Oregon, but just in California, there used to be an, a huge number of otters in San Diego, San Diego, Orange County, South Bay, Malibu, uh, to Santa Barbara, Halama, Vandenberg Air Force. They all had them up there. And so what they would do is, unlike fish, they have little hands. They would swim down to the bottom and be able to pull these urchins off by the dozens, go up to the surface and eat them on their chest. And that was how the urchins were controlled. Their number was controlled and they didn't eat away all of the kelp. When the water quality dropped in California dramatically from really the areas where you're not seeing the otters anymore, San Diego to, to not Santa Barbara, but to basically Ventura, gone were the otters. And of course, the otters were a problem with the with the kelp harvesting. When you're talking about the 1920s, 30s, and 40s in California, especially in Los Angeles in the South Bay, there was a tremendous amount of kelp harvesting there. The kelp was at least a mile wide in Hermosa Beach back in those days. And so when they went to cull the kelp, they would not only kill the, the otters, but they would, you know, the otters were in their way, kind of similar to the way sharks were we believed back in the 50s and 60s where we just on our way to Catalina shoot them with a gun on the way because we thought they weren't useful for the environment. So when they got rid of the otters, the sea urchins went out of control. They ate all of this kelp. And then they said, you know, we're going to close these areas, make these MPAs closures, and we're going to study them and this, that, and the other thing. And in the meantime, <laughs> they just kept eating away and off floated their kelp. And so now they're saying, well, we want to have, you know, this group of recreational divers or we want to have commercial uh, operations come in and get rid of some of these urchins. But they backed themselves in a corner because they wrote laws in such a manner that said you can't do that without getting a special exception permit. 
And those permits, which, which are possible to get, they're kind of like this whole Coastal Commission fixing the parking lot. They absolutely take years for them to make them available. They don't just go like, okay, here's the problem. This is what the solution is. We know it. We have all these free recreational divers. Like when you go north of San Francisco to San Mateo area up there, they have a big club up there that they have been um, asking, volunteering, let's say, for three or four years now to say our club, hundreds of us, will go out and get rid of all of those for you at no cost. And they're not able to do it because they have to go through the permitting process. Gang, you guys need to understand and listen to what we're talking about. This bureaucracy is just absolutely ludicrous. You don't understand. When you, if you were to go to one of these meetings where they decide this stuff, it's ludicrous because the, the answer is right there. They all know the answer, but then they have to have 700 meetings about the answer to make sure that everybody lines up for the answer it's it blows my mind that's why when i used to go with my father and stuff bill really i know everybody out there knows who i am now i don't have a filter so i would go to these meetings and i would get pissed and i would stand up and talk out of turn out of and then they would go well dave you can't come to these me i'd be like this is ridiculous my dad's all you gotta let the process be the process i'm like these guys are so full of crap. I was at a meeting once when we were, now that I know, I don't even go to the, the new MLP hearings when they have them because I sat up in this one meeting and one of these guys got up in the middle and a scientist got up in the middle of the meeting and told everybody in the crowd that the water in the MLP is cleaner than the water outside the MLP. And, and I, <laughs> I, I'd i had enough. I couldn't take it anymore because my whole life's been on the ocean. So I'm like, wait a minute, gang. I just stood up in the middle of the meeting and spun around and talked to all the people. And I said, that's an impossibility. That cannot be. That's impossible. When we put these MLPs into effect, we didn't build walls around them. The water comes and goes, comes and goes. So whatever water you're seeing the quality in tomorrow that water is going to be 10 miles south of there what what do you what do you what kind of crap are you blowing into our butts gang and I, it just pissed me off so bad and, and i went to so many meetings and i would get so angry because the lack of knowledge and the garbage that spews out of these people's mouths and i don't have an education but i have an education because i grew up on the ocean my whole life and i can see what's going on and there's no difference in the water quality in an MLP or outside of MLP, Bill. There's just, you know that. That's right. <laughs> but here's something I was talking about on my show yesterday. It was all about the artificial reef system. And I was quoting stuff and I was mm -hmm. reading about them. And the thing that my father, you, Wayne, a lot of us were saying when they were putting these MLPs into effect, to stop us from recreational fishing in these areas. It's like, wait a minute. A lot of these MLPs were put into place over the top of these artificial reefs. And I want you to talk about, because you're way into this, but they took our money from our fishing licenses and they built these artificial reefs for us. That's the only reason they were built, were for us to go recreational right. fishing on these artificial reefs and then the mlp came and they said we don't care we're gonna close them anyway and it's like and then they closed the the big area that blew our minds was they closed that aliso area where there's a sewer pipe running through it that's an impossible if you read the mlp and then you go well, wait a minute there's a sewer pipe in the middle of the mlp this doesn't work and they said we don't care we're closing it anyway <sighs> drives you crazy you know the you know all about the artificial reef system right oh oh absolutely you know it, it does make you wonder if they just like you know pointed to a map on the wall you know close their eyes like okay we're closing uh, here and here i mean first of all they there is only like in the ocean probably 28 percent of the ocean bottom off of off of california southern california it is uh habited by fish that you would catch and you would fish for and much of it is a desert 
So like, you know, when they did the process, of course, they didn't say, oh, we're taking all this bad stuff over here and bad area over here. and We're going to close those off and see if they're getting better. They took the very pristine places that we used to fish and not all of them, but a number of them. Point Vincenti is a very good example in Palos Verdes and, and closed it off. So especially a place like Point Vincenti where you had like five boats a year fishing there <laughs> and, and they go, oh, we're going to close it off. You know, too many people there. Um, so they took some of the best places and, and then they have very little scientific evidence and done, and done a very small amount of science on all these. Like the other day they just came out and they said that their statement was that, um, gosh, I got it written down over here somewhere that inshore fishing, in other words, the way that you and I would say is surf fishing, um, has cleaner water inside a closed area than in a non-closed area. Okay, first of all, completely unscientific. Second of all, they have no, they've never gone out and tested the water to see if it's better. If somebody drove by and it was, the water was clear that day. So they said it's better. And they don't think that like fish and water moves. So, you know, a lot of this stuff was just kind of a land grab for them to close off areas, make less accessible to fishing. Um, when you look at the California coast in, in particular, you've got about, gosh, I'd say maybe we're around 58% of it is closed to fishing. Because remember, you have things like the MLP areas, Marine Life Protection Act areas. You've got the sanctuaries. But what people forget often is you have all of the land that's closed because of Camp Pendleton, Vandenberg Air Force Base, um, uh, Fort Bragg. And then in addition to that, you have the private uh, beaches that are owned that are closed. All of the Hollister Ranch, 12 miles that is owned by the... Um, uh, um, can't remember the name of it, but, but up in the central coast, there's 12 miles of coastland that's privately owned that's close too. So when you add all of that up, you know, we've really lost about close to 60% of what was once available for us to go fishing. And we can make do with what we have, but we can't make do with them closing more. No, and it doesn't make any sense. And like I was playing for the last couple of months, the interview with Frank Lepresti where Frank was saying, He'd been to enough meetings where he heard them say, we are on a mission to close fishing, period, in the state of California. That's what we want to do. No science, no nothing. We want to close fishing. One of my good friends, Tim Ogilvie, is asking another question. How did these people get so much power? And I'll let you answer that because I'll go on and on and on about it. But how did they get so much power? Well, you know, well, first of all, people, uh, politicians are the ones, even though, you know, like there's that old saying that um, the golden rule that the people with gold make all the rules. Well, we're the citizens of the state of California and we're the ones who are all the gold. We're the ones who pay our taxes and provide all that. But there's a complete separation between what most of the people, the majority of peak citizens of California want and what the small number of politicians who make the decisions in California want. And whatever the, the governor wants or, or, or his minions want is what gets done in California. You know, they are required by law to do certain things to allow us to have comment periods. There's rules that say that they need to use the best available science, that they need to spend money on science and things like that. But they don't do those things or they just do them topically to, to, um, to satisfy the requirement. But they've already made up their mind what they're going to do otherwise, way before they ask for our opinions about things. And m most of the time, some of their decisions are made on science and they've done a very good job on certain things. In, in, I, I think in large part, um, bottom fish, all the rock fish, they've done a good job on that. But many of their decisions are made emotionally, emotionally and also based on possibly where they're getting their money and their grants and so forth from. So we don't have a lot of science. That's what it, with CCA we work hard on is raising money to provide science um, that can be used by the Department of Fish and Game or the, the Fish and Game Commission in particular for them to look at it and make an equitable decision. 
the other thing too is they're so and and I'll, I'm getting off my soapbox after this. We need to talk about fishing. Yes. Is that they're so hung up now on uh, diversity, inclusion, and equity. They're so hung up on that that like they're basing that in climate change. All of their decisions are based around that. They're not looking at everything as a whole. They're just looking at like how can we get more bus loads of people down over here and that type of thing. And so they're not concentrating on the marine environment and what will make the marine environment sub- sustainable and and ongoing and productive. They're looking at all of these other human factors that have nothing to do with the ocean. It's pretty amazing. Pretty sad, but we got off on a top yeah. tangent here going for quite a while. And so we're going to bring it back into the fishing thing. And we got some we got some things going on right now in Southern California. Once again, the halibut are making a tremendous showing. Bill. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's been some epic counts coming in from Catalina and from along the coast. What have you been hearing about it as far as the surf fishing goes? Are you, are you guys, you and your friends, putting together some nice halibut? catches is that going on in southern california in the surf right now yeah oh there's been some great halibut fishing um really from the whole kind of reporting area santa barbara to all the way to san diego um great halibut fishing like so much of it in the past month i would say has to do with fishing around you know uh estuary entrances um uh, harbor entrances and in particular up against structures. So, you know, along the jetties, um, anywhere where you have natural structure where there's rocks and, and the predominant number of the fish have really come from like three different lure would be, you know, the lucky craft, the battle star, the Rapala hard bait, you know, five, six inch, 110 centimeter, three quarter ounce, uh, basically anchovy sardine patterns, those type of things. Those have, have been very productive. Um, crocodiles have been productive in the last month. I've seen a couple of legals come off of crocodiles. And then, of course, the, the white swim bait or the white fluke used on the drop shot. All of those have been working really well in the surf. But the secret is, you know, go to where like Bolsa Chica Inlet, Talbert Inlet, Santa Ana River along the um, 60th Street down to about 50th, 50th or 45th Street in Newport Beach where the jetties are. Anywhere that you're fishing, you want to fish along where their structure meets sand because this time of year, that's where all of the halibut are going to gang up because that's where their food is. They don't have grunion runs. So when there's grunion runs in the summer, so we have them all the way. They kind of begin in March and they go through August. They're at their height in, in June and July, really. That's when the halibut spread out on the beach and follow these giant schools of grunion. And that's where they feed. But this time of year, they're all gone. So where do they find their food? They're not going to just lay on the sand. They've got to feed. So they're going to come up adjacent to rock structure and right where sand meets the rocks. That's where they're going to be congregating that's where we're going to be feeding that's where we're going to be hiding for winter all right gang i just put the qr code for bill's calendar so we're talking about this halibut thing this calendar is incredible because we're going to talk now about tide and this calendar if you haven't seen bill's calendar this calendar is an incredible tool and if you're going to be involved in surf fishing you're going to need this tool is going to change everything so we're going to talk about your calendar here in just a second. My good friend John and his wife, Tina Stanley, they just got their daughter a nice Akuma Tundra surf fishing rod set up. And they're asking, where can she get the best? Their daughter loves to fish, and she they want to make sure that she can get the most information. You have a place where they can gather information for surf fishing, don't you? I do. They they can go right to my site, which is fishthesurf.com. Nice job of setting it up there, <laughs> Dave. <laughs> but they can go to fishthesurf.com. And on that site, it's just an edu- educational site. And I talk about all the different types of surf fish they are. And of course, pictures of all those. Um, how to rig up, what rigging to use, what type of hooks, sinkers, swivels, where to find fish. I have 
a couple dozen articles on there. I'm going to, I have about 300 to put on there. So I'm working on that, but those articles will teach you how to find halibut at the beach, how to catch these giant slab perch this winter at the beach. Where's the place that you can find not only fine bait, but find free bait where you don't have to pay any money for it, but it's the best thing to use out in the ocean. All of that's available on that site. And it's easy to just kind of surf back and forth on it, pick up bits of information. And then the other thing is, you know, you want to go to um, a site like Bloody Decks, which is going to have a surf fishing forum and you'll be able to see what people are catching and they'll be given, be able to give you great ideas about what they're using. And then another great place to go is to go to Facebook and friend um, California Surf Fishing. It's a really great group of people. They're everywhere from really San Francisco to the Mexican border. And they post every day what they're catching, where they're catching, what they're using for bait. That is how you learn. And, and the last thing I want to say to everybody who's a surf angler or wants to be one is, you know, favorite um, on the Internet, some webcams, Huntington Beach, HB Cams is a really good one. With, which has cameras on the beach 24 hours a day. So you can go to those and add minus tides, different, you can look at the different tides. You can see how crowded it is at the beach. You can see how windy it is down there, how big the surf is. You can get all of this information in advance before you actually go down to the beach and go fishing. And Bill, the tide is super important when you're surf fishing. A lot of spots when the tide is as high as it can be, they're tough to get. When it's as low as it can be, they're tough to, tough to get because they're non-existent. That tide calendar that you have is an incredible tool, gang. Okay? Grab the QR code if you're watching this, listening. If you're not, if you're driving around listening, Bill will tell you how to get the calendar here in a few seconds. Those of you that are watching us live right now, make sure you grab the QR code. Maybe grab it after the show, whatever. You want to have one of these calendars. They're great to have in your house because you all need a calendar in your house anyway. We can't just always be staring at the phone. The pictures are incredible, but the tide mm. chart, the way it flows and the way that you can see it, we use it. I mean, we used it today. When we caught that big Dorado we caught today, believe me, we were on the tide. We were right where we needed to be when the tide went slack. Everything matters when you're out fishing. And uh, tide is probably one of the most important things for surf fishing. I, I, from listening to you, Bill, I know how important tide is. So go ahead and talk about that. I'm trying to find the pictures Elliot gave me of your tide calendar. I'm trying to see if I still have them here while you're talking. Okay. Yeah, tides, you know, the tide is the, the number one most important thing to surf fishing. Um, you can catch fish all times of the day. You know, sometimes when you go fishing, it's like, ah, oh, it's just that's, well, take, for example, white sea bass. You know, it's just like in the night or first thing in the morning and, and then the bite shuts off and it's over. Surf fishing, the, your, your success at it is predicated by where the tides are. And that's in conjunction to where you're fishing. So you're fishing on a dredged beach. So you look at a dredged beach, you're thinking of, all of the South Bay, Palos Verdes, all the way to Santa Monica, or um, all of um, Orange County beaches up to from Newport Beach to the Huntington Harbor. That's all dredged um, down in San Diego, Pacific Beach, Mission Beach. Those are all dredged. You're going to fish two hours before high tide to two hours after high tide. That's going to be your best fishing tides. And then other places like, for example, take the Newport Jetties. Like who wouldn't want to be able to cast a bait out from the sand right in front of the very front of the jetty? I mean, who gets a bait down there? So what I do is I look at the tide chart and I look for a minus tide. And, and of course, December's got some fabulous tides and, and, and January's got some pretty big tides too. And I look at a negative tide and when it's negative, I know I can take my rod and reel, my bait. I can walk down to the beach. I can walk out in an area that would normally be under six feet of water. So I'm that much farther out and then cast around the very front of these jetties. And there are some big fish out there. There's some really giant fish right off the end of those jetties that 99% of the time you can't reach. So that tide chart really helps you to figure out where am I going fishing and when am I going fishing? So I just pulled that picture up. I, I know you saw it on the screen there, but gang, when Bill's talking about it, if you look at, I'm going to throw it back up here for a minute. I want you to talk about your calendar real quick. Let's go to that September 
that 27th, 28th, 29th, and 30th gang, if you see it on there, that was this year, 2023. But look at those giant tide swings. This is what Bill's talking about. This is when the fish are going to be the most active. This is why this calendar is like, as far as fishing goes, this is like the holy, the Bible of fishing, especially surf fishing. If you look at those tides, the 27th, 28th, 29th, and 30th, you guys can all see them. And those of you that are driving, I'm sorry, but we'll give you some type of an idea why we're talking. These are giant tidal swings. It's a big, giant graph. It almost looks like the way that the economy was three years ago and the way it is now. That would be the valley at the bottom on the 28th. <laughs> the way it was three years ago would be the top. No, I'm just kidding. I can't help it. I, I didn't mean to say that. Orange man bad. <laughs> Good for yourself. Can't help it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, if you look at the 29th, you look at that day in September the 29th, that was a full moon. And you had a 3.33 in the morning, you had a minus 0.2. And at 9.45 in the morning, you had a 6.1. So you had a 6.3 foot tide change. That's a big tide change. You have a lot of, lot of water moving at that time so it gives you some disadvantages because a lot of water's moving but then at the same time it gives you a lot of advantages like at a time like that i would look at it and say i'm going to be standing out on the end of a jetty in the last two hours before it comes to high tide because if the water is coming out of an estuary on the right hand side of the jetty i at the tip of the jetty on the left hand side that water is wrapping around the jetty and it's making a big eddy circulation right there which is churning up all of this creating all of this oxygen in the water and that's right where the fish are going to be all of these different tides they offer you as you learn a little bit more different options in surf fishing and really tell you where is the best place to go based on the tide so gang if you look i put the qr code back up there if you look at the bottom line there it says free shipping you can get this calendar it helps support cca but also it's going to help you to not suck at fishing. If, you, if you're tired of sucking at fishing, this will make it so you don't suck. Or at least when you do suck, you'll know why you suck. This is a great <laughs> gift package, gang. You want to grab that QR code. Bill, there's a lot of people driving around right now listening to the podcast. I know it's hard to believe that people would listen to me, but there are. And uh, they probably want to get the calendar too. So let them know verbally how can you get this calendar. Because QR code's there, and that works good. But how can I get it if I don't have the QR code? Sure. There's a couple of different places to get it, which is great. It's all over. Um, one is you just go to my store, surffishtackle.com, surffishtackle.com. And then it's at every tackle shop. It's at all the landings from Santa Barbara to San Diego. We would love you to pick it up at any of the stores or the landings. We really want to support them also. CCA really is you know, their whole purpose is to support the fishing industry. So any one of the landings or stores, uh, tackle shops that you like to go to your favorite shop has it. If they don't have it for any reason. Just tell them to call me. Be happy to send some over there to them. But I think most everybody's got them. And we're really coming down to the end. I think we've out of about three and a half thousand. We might, there might only be, you know, six or 700 left in all of LA, Orange County and San Diego County. So certainly now's the time to get them. And uh, it's, a, it's just a great thing to have. It's like, like Dave said, incredible photography. There's um, a quote on every page or some really great quotes in there. One of my favorite here is on that September month. It says, quote, I'd rather be fishing, unquote. Jimmy L. Glass from the Louisiana electric chair, 1987. So there's a bunch of good sayings on there for you to memorize and, and whip out at the bar with your friends. Um, there's all kinds of tips on fishing in there. There's uh, knot inf you know, information about tying different types of knots, the most important knots for all fishing, not just for surf fishing. So it's a great thing to pick up. And then, of course, it supports CCA and helps them get the funding that they need to protect anglers' rights, to continue their hatchery science, and to help take kids and so forth fishing. And I have a question here. Going to go with this. 
You didn't leave your name, so I don't know who you are, but what is your favorite conventional reel for fly lining anchovies? Mine is the new Tesoro series reels from Akuma. It's a star drag reel. The thing is super smooth. I use a nine foot medium heavy uh, PCH rod. Everything I talk about as far as fishing rods and reels, it's always Akuma. I've been using Akuma for the last 15 years. I fish at a very high level. I fish a lot of days. I fish I used to fish 250 days a year when I was doing it for a living, and I used all Akuma reels on all the yachts I run. And then now that I fish for quote-unquote fun, I probably fish two or three days a week anyway because I love to fish. And I use my Tesoro reels or I use my Cortez reels, and I use the PCH rods, and I always have a 9- or 10-foot rod because that's what I like, and it makes it easier to cast that anchovy or the smaller baits. Like on these videos I'm posting right now, we're using baby mullet. We're using little mullets, like two and a half, three inch mullets, fly lining them into the ed, the uh, mangrove roots. Oh, just incredible. Just a fun fishery. But the Tesoro series reels, you can't go wrong. They're made by Akuma. Go check them out. Go to akuma.com and look at all the different reels. And then, um, Bill, as far as we're trying to put together a thing, gang, Bill and I working on it so that Bill becomes part of your saltwater guide and all the information will be right there at your fingertips with my app. I have a great app that we built. We spent a phenomenal amount of money. If you knew how much money you'd go, how in the hell did a fisherman pay for an app? I have an app that's top of the line, as best of the best can be. And also we have about 580 plus videos on the website that are all set up so that you can catch more fish when you go fishing and as soon as bill jumps on here we'll have another 30 or 40 or 50 brand new videos that show you surf fishing that'll be a different thing we'll be talking about it probably beginning of the year we're running out of time here we've been going for a full hour already i want to make sure you all understand that uh that calendar would be a great gift great stocking stuffer if you're looking for things to get for your family and friends and you don't know what to get if you're any of your friends fish they need that calendar all the yachts i drive all the boats that i fish on we all have bill's calendars because it's just that we could jump on our phone and try to google how what the tide is or we could go on our gps and take it off the screen that we're on and look at the tide or we can just glance at the the calendar and it's right there and it tells us what's going on today i was able to watch what the dorado were doing and watch what the frigate birds were doing and i'm like hey look at that right there on bill's calendar we're going into slack tide everything's floating that's why the frigates are all of it matters everything matters but gang i want you to understand i got this phenomenal gift certificate going on right now this is out of the kindness of my heart i'm giving you a lifetime membership to my website $350. All you have to do in order to win to get that amount is live for two years and you paid for it. If you're a member for two years, $350 for a lifetime membership gives you all the bundles that are included in it. $350 lifetime membership. Call me at 949-374-0786. I'll sign you right up today. I'll even give you a free look for a couple of days to see if it's worth $350. I have 4,100 members. They're all on there. The community is insane. The people sharing all the information are absolutely killing the fish, lobsters, halibut, tuna, dorado, white sea bass. We, we put together a great community of fishermen and we're all trying to make everybody better. And we all need to get together. Bill will tell you, Frank Lepresti will tell you, we all, need to get together we all need to stand united because they are on a mission to stop fishing they are on a big time mission to stop fishing gang and we do this podcast monday through fridays normally at 12 o'clock today we went late because dave wanted to go fishing again because he hadn't been fishing for almost a whole day so he had to get back out there again <laughs> And I had a really good time. We got a 45 pound Dorado today. Pretty incredible fish. If you haven't seen it, it's on every piece of social media on the planet Earth. And I sent the picture to everybody because I was just, it was one of, it's the third biggest Dorado I've ever seen in my life. And it was pretty spectacular. We caught it in 100 feet of water 
right off the lighthouse. I mean, there's so much wow. cool stuff going on down here right now. Water's 80 degrees here, Bill, right now. Oh, my gosh. Wow. And I know over the summer it was up around 95 at some point. Yeah, it was crazy. But it's still 80, and we're, what, four days away from Christmas? Come on. This oh, is my fun. gosh. This That's is amazing. Crazy. This is crazy. And your good friend, Wes, Cabo Surf Fish, he had an incredible day yesterday catching Dorado on the beach down here. Just incredible. He's and he'll, he'll absolutely an amazing, amazing angler. Just an amazing angler. Really is. He's and he's an amazing human being. He's just a just a phenomenal human. And you're well, you're going to get to see both of us now. You tricked both of us into coming to. I did. I did. I did. I tricked both of you to come to the Bard Hall show in, in Long Beach, and we're really looking forward to it. And, and I know there's going to be a lot of listeners and just a lot of folks in general have a lot of questions. And we're going to be there at the show to try to answer all of your questions. And and I'm telling you, when you see these fish that, that uh, Wes has caught um, from the beach, um, in addition to his tarpon that he got last summer um, down in Florida, it's going to absolutely blow your mind that people can catch, and everybody out there is one of them, these type of fish from the beach. It, it's absolutely amazing. And, and beach angling makes you a better boat angler. And a boat angler, all of the angling that you do, whether it's from the boat or the lake or the beach, it all helps you down the line to catch more fish and just be better at what you love to do. Absolutely. Practice makes perfect. And gang, we'll be here. Bill's going to try to become a, a permanent fixture on Wednesdays. If his, if his schedule allows it, he's going to try to be on here as much as he possibly can. We have Him and I have a great time talking, and we have a great time trying to let you all know what's going on out here on this great big ocean of ours. And we want to all make sure that we get to keep fishing. So let's all get together. Let's support CCA. It, and Tim, the thing I... Bill kind of touched on it, but I'll tell you why. The people with all the money are controlling this. They're, they're on a mission to stop fishing. And so the only thing we can do to try to fight them is be involved with CCA. It's the, Whether you like CCA or not, it's the only voice we have at the table, gang. Other than that, we have no voice. So we all need to be united in this thing. And it's going to take money, unfortunately, it all takes money. It's going to take money to fight this thing. And we can't give up. We all got to work together and try to keep their common goal to go fishing. Right? Because, God, Bill, can you imagine if we couldn't go fishing? Oh. Yeah, well, I saw somebody with the best T-shirt ever. It said, um, it said something like, I can't remember the exact words, but it said something like, I took up fishing because it's frowned upon to punch people in the face. <laughs> <laughs> So there you yeah. go. That's why people go fishing. <laughs> that so if you guys have anything, a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars, a hundred dollars, a million dollars, whatever, donations right there, CCA California, CCACalifornia.org for those of you driving around. But the rest of you, there's the QR code right there. Make sure you grab one of Bill's calendars. Make sure you grab my lifetime gift certificate. Make sure you Give a donation to CCA. Bill and I are lifetime members. We gave, we dug deep and gave, and we also do a ton of stuff for CCA to keep the word out there to help promote this, so that we can keep fishing in California. Yeah, and and Dave, if I could just say another thing about CCA's donations, um, CCA, not unlike many other big um, nonprofit organizations has a way to make monthly donations for them automatically where you can tie, you can say, and this is what I do. I donate $10 a month. It comes out automatically out of my PayPal account every month. I never notice I have $10 less in my PayPal account. You can hook it up to a credit card, your checking account, PayPal account, Venmo, all kinds of different ways to make it really easy. And then every month you make an automatic donation to them. At this time of year, they'll send you a letter that gives you a full tax deduction. They're a 501 C3 organization. So you get a tax deduction for whatever you donate to them. And it's absolutely painless. I've done it, it's been three years for me. Personally, be honest with you, I've never even noticed it's come out of my account, but I know the $120 a year that I give 
really helps them to to protect my right to fish absolutely gang and if even if you don't like to fish there's someone in your family or friends that do cca matters it's our only voice at the table so make sure that you're involved at any level you can it'll all it all helps none of this is going to happen if we don't support it so thank you bill very very much everybody out there thank you all i will be here with my beautiful wife tomorrow tomorrow's thursday text the show thursday kelly girl and i will be telling some cool stories like we did last week and then friday you're not even going to believe this we have the man anthony shea joining us on the podcast gang if you don't know who anthony shea is he is owner of team bad company they're doing the world tour they're going all over the world fishing for thousand pound marlin and surface swordfish anthony shea is a tremendous fisherman a phenomenal friend he started war heroes on water that i've been involved with for six years coming on seven years he's a phenomenal human being he started out working on the sport boats a lot of people don't know who anthony shea is they just see all the stuff that like oh wow that's just another billionaire act like you can't even yeah he's a multi-billionaire yeah and he's going to be on my show on Friday. Him and I are going to be talking about where he came from. We're going to talk about things that none of you have ever heard before. How he got into fishing, where he started out, what, how he got such a phenomenal work ethic. He's a self-made man. No one gave this man a thing. And he's a multi-billionaire. Mm -hmm. okay? You don't understand. There's not a lot of people that have had this man on their podcast. He's coming on my podcast. He saw what a great job Steve Blasley and Pete Grosbeck both did, who have both been employed by this man for a while. He's going to be on the show. It's going to be phenomenal. You don't want to miss Friday. You don't want to miss tomorrow. Kelly Girl is going to be on the show. I mean, come on. But Friday is going to be pretty special. I'm very excited to have Anthony on here. And I want you all to hear who the man is because there's a lot of things he's done. A lot of people have had a lot of interviews with them, but no one's ever got into the nitty gritty of where this man came from. So you're all going to learn a lot about Anthony Shea on the show on Friday. So, Bill, thank you for your time. I'm going to let you go hang out with your family. Go out and watch that snow come down. It's kind of cold right now, isn't it? Yeah, it's, uh, it's six now. <laughs> six. Six. It's, it's a seven. heat wave out here. <laughs> it's 78 here. <laughs> <laughs> you're killing me <laughs> and the water's 80 all right everybody thank you for a great show thank you all for all the questions thanks for being a part of don't forget to donate don't forget to check us out 